Thank you. Yes, I'm Jan van Boekel. I uh, live now for a time in Sweden. I'm from the Netherlands, Amsterdam. And I work uh, partly here at Uppsala, at the same as I'm in climate change leadership nodes. And I partly work in my Gothenburg, Jutteborg. Uh, and my background is in arts, arts education. I'll tell a lot about this in this lecture. But I, my specific interest at the moment is how art can be of relevance, of meaning, in an age of climate change and radical uncertainty, which will also be a topic of my presentation. But I would like to start with a moment of silence, just to let the silence sink in. These three forms from nature found in the field in a loop. I would like to invite you to pass them along amongst you and to look at them as if you see them for the first time in your life. What you see with the loop. So maybe you can, in a later day, when after the break is open, we return. So, my theme is the lively eyes. This may sound a bit cryptic, a bit. Fuzzy, maybe a bit poetic, but maybe it's also very concrete. I've noticed when I launched the title of this presentation that many people can some way relate to it. What this lecture is not going to do is going to give you a neat take home message, a deliverable. It's not going to connect the dots. <coughs> what I'm going to try to do in this lecture is to present a go out into the world message and to leave the dots for what they are and to instead look at the in-between space. My field in art education is arts-based environmental education. Very, in a nutshell, what this means is what does environmental education become if you start with the arts. So you don't start with science, you don't start with biology, but you start with an artistic way of relating to the world. The idea is, one of the ideas here is that you can, through the arts, can become in a very attentive mode, that you pay attention to nature, to the world, to what the objects that are going around, uh, in a new way, sort of putting on the shelf all the ideas that you might have before, and trying to see what is actually happening. Uh, in my study uh, on this subject, I was very much inspired, about uh, 10, 12 years ago, when I learned about what they were doing in Finland in the mid-1990s, these children, they would uh, take them, the art school would take them to this village, this made, made of village in the woods, where they would take the children back 9,000 years back in time. And then they would uh, have food there, they make their own food, some stayed overnight, they baked their own bread, etc. And when they came there, the, the younger children would stay overnight with their parents, the older children would sleep there. But they, when they would come to this area, they would come to a specific place, they would throw a small pebble out, and when they throw this pebble, they would say a poem, and when they had said this poem, at that moment they were in this new world, this enchanted world of 9,000 years ago. And then they worked with the teachers, doing all kinds of exciting things like theater, and, um, different kind of exercises, um, playful, engaging. And you, what developed was a very intimate, deep relation of what I would take to be the light in the eyes, of a very yeah, real, authentic contact between uh, the both learners and the people who facilitate the learning. I tried to do, in my research, in my practice, uh, inspired by this, something similar, that, for example, here as people, we are sculpting our own bodies, but with our eyes closed in this miniature form. <coughs> Here we do it at the beach of uh, Gotland. Here inside we work with uh, development uh, of organic forms through time, how things change in evolution. Here we do it 
before. Uh, when I work with a group intensively, maybe for a few days, I might take them, like I did in Estonia, take them to the forest and then I do a very small uh, exercise of uh, activity and it is sharing with a partner the memory of a meaningful work that you once made in your life uh, that was somehow important to you and then you tell it to the other person and then the other person tells it back and then later you share with the whole group these stories that come about. What I noticed uh, time and again, this is the moment when the stories are being shared, that for example is this girl in the middle, there is this sort of intensity of uh, uh, way of looking, of being present, that ordinarily in education you miss out on, because people often, uh, when they are in an education situation, they behave as a proper student is uh, supposed to do, and uh, they are more in a repetitive mode, more of a mode of take in, not presenting themselves. So, I go now a bit deeper on this idea of the light in the eyes. Art from Finland. There is, I think there is something special uh, that if you work uh, with people in this presence, attending to each other in this very direct way, uh, that a lot of crap, a lot of uh, noise is taken aside because you have a sort of a, a, an intimate, a direct connection with other people. And uh, it's almost like out of the eye, there is a ray going out of your eye into the world. And when I studied this a bit more carefully, what actually is going on um, with uh, our, uh, the faculty of eyesight, I found in uh, history that there is this uh, idea from the old Greeks that actually you might conceive of seeing, as the way they conceived it, as indeed something that comes from the eye. So Amphidoclus, uh, the Greek shaman and scientist from way before Christ, he had this idea that Aphrodite fashioned our eyes out of the four elements of earth, water, air, and fire. Next, the eye was permitted to transmit an interior fire through the water of the eye and out into the world, thereby giving rise to sight. So that there's a fire in the eye causing the ray going out of the eye. And this idea stayed with us for almost one and a half millennia, uh, millennium. So in this uh, image from the 1702, you find the same idea of the, the rays uh, going from the eyes up to the world. All these people look through these rays at <coughs> the dragon. So something is emanated here from the eyes to the world. But this idea, I think, when you uh, have this experience of uh, the pedagogy of the light in the eyes, this connection of eyes meeting each other, being uh, attentive to each other's presence, uh, that you, if this happens, then something uh, special to me happens because it means that you establish a kind of bond that you can take further in the next steps of what you do. It builds a kind of trust, but also a kind of reassurance that you can deal with uh, insecurity, uncertainty, that you can allow yourself to be vulnerable. So here, for example, again in Estonia, you see we're doing a workshop at Everybody, as we work there, uh, is present and is attending to each other. There's a sort of excitement. It, it doesn't happen all the time, but it just has these sort of peak moments. Uh, 
Um, in this intensity, you might find qualities of euphoria, a sense of ease and well-being, a pleasant excitement. You might have enthusiasm, intense enjoyment, interest or approval. Originally, this was used to refer to a person who was possessed by the gods. And ecstasy is from the Greek word to be or to stand outside oneself, a removal to elsewhere, a removal of the mind or body from its normal place of function. Ecstasy is a subjective experience of total involvement. And I think it's interesting, if you look at the, the root of this word, ex and stasi, stasis, the moving away from the place, moving away from where you ordinarily are. So you make a crossing into something new. And this relates to the idea of the effect, um, and I go back to one uh, meaning of it, of William James, the American philosopher, psychologist. He said, we feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, afraid because we tremble. So he turns it up on its head in a way. He says, a perception immediately produces an effect within the body. Only later, we take some distance, when we step back, the effect is transformed into a recognizable emotion. So first the body reacts, the body responds to the situation, you get the light in the eyes, so you get excited, and then later you, you give the rationalizations why this is happening, you make sense of it. But this is like another moment. The body responds immediately, directly. So in this idea, of, through this excitement, through this enthusiasm, <coughs> being present to what is presenting itself, I want to uh, sketch three contrasts where I sort of try to understand what is happening. And I put in, in this graph here that one contrast is between propulsiveness and open-endedness, the vertical one, one between the static and the dynamic, and the third one between the receptive undergoing and the creative acting upon. And all these, uh, all these contrasts, they cross a boundary between control and surrender. So control is the idea that you're still in charge, that you still are able to grasp what is going on, that you can steer it in a direction, and the surrender is that you let go, that you are in a mode of receptivity. So the first one is the, the contrast between propulsiveness and open-endedness, is this uh, contrast. But I start with a quote from Eugène Ionesco, who wrote the book Renosos. He says, in all the cities of the world it is the same, the universal and modern man is the man in a rush. A man who has no time, who is a prisoner of necessity, who cannot understand that a thing might perhaps be without usefulness. Nor does he understand that at the bottom it is the useful that may be useless and a back-breaking burden. If one does not understand the usefulness of the useless and the uselessness of the useful, one cannot understand art. In a country where art is not understood is a country of slaves and robots. So this idea of purpose, propulsiveness, or uh, self-conscious propulsiveness, as Gregory Bateson, the biologist and philosopher, called it, um, for him it is a key phrase in which, in which he meant that we have learned as Western people to identify single goals for our purposes. Part of this is our habit of thinking of causality as a series of straight line effects from A to B, without allowing for the, all the interpenetrating influences and effects flowing between each of us and the wider living world. So we only look at these straight lines, A to B, but we don't see the larger context within which things are happening. We want to get quickly at what we want, not to act with maximum wisdom in order to live, but to follow the shortest logical or causal path to get what you next want. Our self-conscious purposiveness lacks the evolutionary wisdom to which our unconscious mental processes still have access. So our unconscious is connected with something larger. But we single out something smaller, that is propulsiveness, this idea of going straight, logically from A to B, uh, singles out or sets apart. But this may sound a bit abstract, but the way to rapidly or understand this is sort of a perpetual mo movement of the Escher. You go across straight line, straight lines, uh, but you always repeat yourself. You, you, there's no improvisation, no newness coming in. You're sort of locked in this chain of constantly repeating yourself. Always climbing up, but never getting there. And I think this uh, idea of purposiveness that Bateson identified is basically what our education has been uh, for most of the time. 
If we see the straight lines, we are get the knowledge from the teacher, and we have to pay attention if he or she says that we have to pay attention. But I would say here there is most likely, most of the time, less uh, uh, light in the eyes. It is an idea of education as knowledge transfer. It's like this percolator that the, the knowledge is poured into you, you're a passive thing in the knowledge that is offered to you by somebody who is knowledgeable, who has the knowledge to give it to you. The ultimate, uh, I think, is the multiple choice te tests. I mean, it allows for only A, B, C, or D. And that's all that is relevant, all that can be measured through the computer. In contrast, remember there was this contrast between purposiveness and open-endedness. Open-endedness is a combination, I would say, of open-mindedness and open-endedness. It's that you basically don't know where you're going. You don't you start maybe at A, but you don't know where B will be ending up. It is basically that you enter in a mode of improvisation. And the root of the word improvisation is improvisus. It's the unforeseen, unexpected, and sudden. I think a very, for me a very nice example of this is the great improvisational artist Keith Jarrett. He once uh, gave a concert in the city of Cologne. 1974, a uh, solo concert on the grand piano, and the story is that he was at the time very ill, he had fever, and, uh, some kind of uh, flu, uh, and uh, he was about to cancel the concert, and he was sort of making up his mind if he could do it or not, because all the people had paid for the tickets, and then he saw that the piano was brought in, and it was not quite the piano that he had asked, it was a very different piano, and he thought, well, it's getting from bad to worse, now also this bad piano. But then something switched in his mind, and he said, well, what the heck, let's do it. Let's just, people have paid for the tickets, so I'll play. And he gave this concert, which is by many people regarded as the singular most interesting concert that he ever gave. That's, but other people have put it to notes, whereas it was a totally improvisational performance. So he was also working with the limits, the situation at hand, uh, improvising his way forward. They'll talk a bit more later about working with the limits, his frames. But I think part of this quality of improvisation you can also bring about in education. Uh, and I have this notion of wrong footing, it comes from playing soccer. It's the idea that if you uh, have an opponent like your opponent is number six, as a player you give the impression that you kick the ball to the left, but on the very last instance you kick it to the right, and then your opponent happens to be standing on the wrong foot. So an act of, act of wrong footing is that you put participants, learners, people that you work with, on the wrong foot. They may expect that you're going to do something, but you do the other thing. And then they're in a moment of uh, bewilderment or puzzling, what is this going to mean? It's a bit like uh, the story of Snow White and the Queen. That the Queen is standing in front of the mirror, asking the mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of all in the country? And each time the mirror says, it's you, the queen. Then one day the mirror says, it's not you, it is Snow White. And then the queen gets mad, and although what happens, he tries to kill uh, Snow White. But that propels the story into motion. And that is uh, basically, you might say, in this uh, diagram, this inciting moment, the moment uh, in storytelling, when something is happening that spins the, uh, the story into action. There's a certain conflict, the business as usual doesn't work any longer, and you have to uh, overcome certain challenges. So the, the, the moment that the, the thing with the, the mirror happens, spins the story into action. It's a, a moment of wrong footing, I would say. So in this moment, you are able to open yourself to a new universe, to a new world, because you cannot fall back on your habits, you cannot fall back on your autopilot mode. You have to improvise your way into the new situation. And I think it's interesting to maybe compare this to a, a writer's passage or initiation that uh, when, uh, for example, with different uh, indigenous peoples, when boys become men or girls become women, that they go through a period of a writer's passage where everything is different than the ordinary. They might sleep uh, they might have sleepless nights for a few nights, they might dress up, the boys might dress up as girls on the other red ground, just to indicate that something is happening, an initiation into a new world that is unfamiliar with everything that you would know beforehand. It 
it is like with Alice in Wonderland that she goes through the mirror to the other side. It's the second book of Alice in Wonderland, uh, Through the Looking Glass. She is able to go through the mirror, and as she steps through the mirror, she goes and comes into this other new world where everything is different than she is used, used to. What is happening if you enter this new territory is that you have to work with what is not there yet. You have to, in a way, prepare yourself to engage with something that you don't know. So what you can, for example, engage in such a situation is what you might call peripheral vision. That usually we are so trained to look at the thing that is right in front of us, that this is what we have in focus. But peripheral vision, you also look at the outskirts. You train yourself to be trying to catch a larger net of possibilities. You also may be paying attention to the in-between space. Again, we often so much look at what is uh, clearly marketed, but there might be more going on that we're not paying attention to in the in-between space. Joseph Boyd, the artist, uh, said that he would like to, he likes to work with the after-image. The after-image is the idea that you look, for example, at a certain color, like I might have a color projected here of green, then you take the green away, and then the after-image is the red color that you see them. That something is evoked uh, by taking it away. So this was for Joseph Boyd's way of working, as he said, with what is not yet there. But it might also be a period of silence. For example, as I started a lecture, or the silence during a walk. If that happens before a session takes place, it tends to qualify or change whatever may happen afterwards. So we are often so trained that we think that things are happening at the moment when it is at stake. When you are in the class, that's the moment when the, the, the important things happen. But what happens before class or after might be just as important. But it's not where our attention is. It's on the periphery, on the horizon of our attention. Another way to work with uh, this uh, wrong footing, or to work with what is not there, is something that Gianni Rodari uh, came up with. He, uh, he was an Italian theater maker. He called it the fantastic binominal. What he would do is he would work with children and suggest maybe two different words, or ask the children to come with two very different words, like maybe the dog and the closet, and then to ask them to combine these words, these binominal, these two names, into a fantastic story. And he says, in the fantastic binominal, the words are not taken in their daily meaning, but they are freed from the verbal chains. They are estranged, they are shifted, they are thrown against one another in a sky that has never been seen before. And I've made that uh, in yellow because I think this is an important thing that they come in a sky that has never been seen before. You try something that has been not, never been done. A story that a child may make with the dog in the closet might be so original that it's quite different from the story that the, the child would make if she, for example, would make a story about the dog and the cat. It's more on familiar ground. And then he says also, and I'll talk more about this, the mind is born out of struggle, not out of tranquility. So there is some need for resistance, some, something that you have to fight uh, against to engage your imagination. And an example of this is uh, in this, uh, you maybe all know about this film, or have seen this film, The Bridge of Spies, where they, uh, in a funny way, I think, worked with this idea of asking children to make stories of two words that are quite dissimilar. So they asked the children to make stories about Containing the word bridge and the word spy. So, this is an example of how they did this. I was thinking maybe a music performance. You've seen from Bridge of Spies for us right now. That's that sound. That's that sound. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then there, here's, the, here's the catch the scenes are not from the actual movie. They were all written by elementary school kids. We gave them no direction, just the title Bridge of Spies. All right, here we go. It's time for kid theater. Here we go. Each other. 
partly because it's so funny, but also because uh, I think the richness, uh, you start with nothing, with only two words, and then there's all this sort of hidden potential that you can access. Maybe because, exactly because the quality of the words being so dissimilar, working with bridge and spines, all these um, stories can potentially uh, evolve. There's something about igniting the imagination there. So maybe a bit along similar lines, but also going in another direction, is this idea of a poor pedagogy. Then I look at the work of Jan Machelein. He's a, uh, a philosopher of education from Belgium, Leuven. And um, he uh, would take his uh, students to the city of Sarajevo, some years ago, maybe for two weeks, students in architecture and in educational science. And they would all get a map and they would draw lines on this map in random fashion across the streets. And then they would do uh, an activity which would be that uh, they would pair up and they would go walk along these lines, try to stick to the lines as much as they could, uh, and then to uh, pay attention to what they would uh, see along those lines. And they would also do it during the day and during the night, so it was rather intense. And then they would report back, and eventually they would show the community, the people of Sarajevo, what they had found in this uh, voyage of discovery of being two uh, weeks in Sarajevo, in these conditions. So the question he asked the students was, what have you seen? What have you heard? What do you think about it? And this became what he called a new practice of educating the gaze. And it's, uh, the, he calls this, this poor pedagogy, and I think it's maybe interesting to note that the poor pedagogy compared to this fantastic binomial, it works with very little means, only some maps and drawings on lines on it as a base. But he said it is about exposition, just like ecstasis, exposition, being out of your position. The road commands our gaze. The road, the arbitrary line, commands our gaze. It's opening up, he said, of an existential space. Attention here is a lack of intention. It implies a kind of waiting. So quite different from a propulsive attitude that you start with an intention of what you're going to do. It is more about uh, attention and it is waiting for what is going to happen. Here knowledge is not meant for understanding, but for cutting, for transformation. Such a pedagogy, you know, would say, is generous because it gives time and space to experience and thought. It is not, he said, getting a liberated view, but it is about liberating, displacing our view. It's not about becoming conscious, but it is about becoming attentive. It is dependent on methods or certain sort of protocol of how you go about walking through the streets. It is, um, it's not dependent on a certain method, but it is on, dependent on discipline of following this, the protocol. The method itself is rather basic. It's not about arriving at a place, but it is about displacing one's gaze. It's not about revealing, and it is looking at what is evident, what is there right in front of you, but maybe you missed out on. It is uh, our practices which allow us to expose ourselves, to be vulnerable, to bring us onto the streets. It's about self-transformation and self-displacement. And in this position of being vulnerable and exposed, uh, and not leading towards a certain predetermined outcome, it's working with the only offer that was the protocol, the, the, sort of the, the guidelines that you got when you go, went out into the streets. And there was a relative seclusion, they were apart from the university, in a different city, on, the, on their own, and it was exhaustive. They would not only do it during the day, but also at night, so it was really, uh, walking for 20 kilometers, uh, it was an exhaustive thing to do. And uh, the teacher and the students were also more or less, I think it was also an interesting aspect, in an equal position, more or less disarmed. They slept in the same cold youth hostel. All this creates conditions, Jan Marchelein says, making it possible that new thoughts can come to one's mind, and one's intentions and urge to judge are suspended and put to the side. And he uh, looked at the meaning of the word education and looked at the two uh, roots. One is the root of educare, the teaching of instilling knowledge, knowledge transfer, caring. But there is another root, and that is the word educere, that is leading out into the world. And the teacher provides uh, some guidelines that lead you out into the world. Uh, not that the teacher is passing his or her knowledge on, but you yourself become your own educator in a way. The 
Other contrast is between receptive undergoing and creative acting upon. This comes from John Dewey, the great American philosopher of education. Uh, and he said, if you have in any uh, major meaningful experience that you have, there's always these two aspects of undergoing experience, surrendering to the experience, uh, being receptive to it, and the, on the other hand, the active component, that you act upon the world, that you create something new, that you engage. So it's a bit like this, uh, undergoing with one part, and uh, actively acting upon on the other. Um, and in that he would say, the sensory awareness is a central part. The root of the word aesthetic uh, is um, also the, that you perceive the world through the senses. And John Dewey would say, in a, it's a bit going out of the field, in a truly aesthetic experience, the viewer and the viewed are one. There is no distinction of self and object. They are so fully integrated that each disappears. So that you're so fully into it that you sort of kind of dissolve in whatever you engage with. It's a bit like this yin and yang symbol, that this receptivity of undergoing the experience and the, uh, actively being involved. They, they sort of combine, but they also have these dots that have elements of each other in the same experience. Won't go too much into this now, this contrast. But uh, I think important, for example, in working with nature, in, uh, working in art-based environment education, that you can switch modes between being very receptive, for example, feeling the moss of the, the plants, um, and the creative, that the sensing, the touching, is informing your making, your creating, and your creating is informing the way you're sensing the world. That it is like a cycle that you go through. And uh, then, uh, Dewey underlined that there's something interesting happening here, that if you have a really strong experience, there is this element of uh, passion, that you, uh, but that relates to pathos. The, there's the same root of the word. And he said, really, there, if you don't have the pain, there is no gain. That there's something of undergoing this strong experience that, that is offering some kind of resistance, that the painfulness of it makes also that it sticks with you, that you don't forget the, the intensity of the experience. So that if you again go to the roots of these words, the pathos is a quality of an experience in life or a work of art that stirs up emotions of pity, sympathy, and sorrow. It's from the ancient Greek words pathos or suffering. And then you have passion, it's any great, strong, powerful emotion, especially romantic love or hate. So that the, the pain and the passion, the, the love and the strong emotion, they're very closely aligned in a way, in these strong experiences. It is that these qualities come about that makes it that it is an experience that sticks with you, that you remember later in life. Or you might say it differently, that this is where the real learning is happening, that you are triggered. It is somehow deeply meaningful to you. Here, for example, I work with students, and it's really a slight idea of this element of pain. It is a very cold day. But they are so excited that they want to paint. The forecast is that we will have uh, showers of rain, and then we go painting anyway. And then working with this resistance, with this painfulness, but also being passionate about doing it, you start to learn something about what you can do with colors in rain. Whereas the more common response would be that on a rainy day you stay inside, it's more comfortable. But here you're finding out what you can still do, you're pushing it to its limits. Of what uh, still can be accomplished uh, with color and paint in the cold weather. And uh, the, the third quality, and maybe I'll, I'll end this part with this, quickly going into this and have a break. Um, so, this is that. Uh, contrast between uh, control and surrender, between the static and the dynamic, and uh, the switching a bit from the image. It says uh, the zones of proximal development, this idea of Lev Vygotsky, a uh, uh, Russian psychologist. Zones of proximal development, if, if you look at life, or a child becoming an uh, adult, that you go through all these phases of life, slowly expanding, learning new things, the idea of the zone of proximal development is that there is a difference between what a learner can do without help and what a learner can do on, um, uh, cannot do without help. So the zone of proximate development is between there, 
to what you are able to accomplish already, what you have already have mastered, that is the, the, the prior zone. And then the new zone, the zone of proximate development, is just that edge between what is still impossible for you to do, but what you can do if somebody is helping you. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the potential for new learning, and the idea is if you go a bit too far in this direction, it's too chaotic, too, too much newness that you don't learn anything at all. But if you stay too much on this side, you just repeat what you already know. And uh, this uh, connects to the idea of why I brought up the static and the dynamic. So this is from a book uh, of Robert Pearson, who also wrote Seven, the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. The second book he wrote was uh, Lila, Inquiry into Morals. And there he looks at static and dynamic quality. And in it he tells a story of, uh, he tells about when a baby is making sense of the world, for example, looking at the head, there's these certain stages when it discovers that the head is actually part of the baby's own body, where it discovers the properties of the face of the mother. That in the beginning, uh, we are all very much in this dynamic quality that we are overwhelmed by the dynamic newness of what we learn. And once we understand that this is indeed our hand, this becomes a static pattern, sort of stored away, and it's less dynamic because we have mastered it already. But in life, we go through these moments that we access something very dynamic, and then when we have understood it and made sense of it, it becomes static and becomes more of the habitual, the, the thing that we already are familiar with. And then he tells a story uh, in the book, uh, Laila, about another book by Walker Percy that's called The Message in the Bottle. And I find it very intriguing, the story that he, one book uh, telling about a story in another book. And it is about a man sitting in a train between uh, a small provincial uh, place, a village in the state of New York, going towards New York. And then he uh, comes to the, uh, the station New Rochelle, he gets out on the concrete uh, from the train, and while he was on the train, he was th uh, thinking about his life, how actually everything is in order, he has a nice family, a nice wife, he has a good income, but he finds it very boring, not exciting at all. And then when he gets on, this, uh, on the, 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 uh, the track, or the, the, the sidewalk, or how do you call it? The platform. What? The platform. The platform, thank you. <laughs> then suddenly it happens that he gets a heart attack, and then he's lying on the concrete, waiting for an ambulance to, to get to, uh, to, uh, that he's helped. While he's lying there, he has some time, he starts to look at his hand. And, and he's, as he is looking at his hand, he's able to look at, at his hand as this marvelous organ that he, he's seeing properties in his hand that he has not paid attention to before. And it's only because of this extremely dynamic situation that he has his heart attack on the, the platform, that he actually can allow himself to study his hand in this way. So it is uh, the example that Pierce gives of how you sometimes need to be shaken up completely to access something dynamic that propels you in another direction, that you can do some, uh, perform some real learning or come to new understanding. This is a, a rather extreme example. But it's um, in this contrast from moving um, here, from static to dynamic, um, it's fine in a way, also maybe relates to the other side, we talked about receptive undergoing and open ended finding a way to relate to something that is completely new, being pushed in a new direction, but also not staying in, in the static, the all too familiar, to find the right balance there. I, I think for the, before the break I leave it at this, but after the break I would like to talk about why, what has all this got to do with climate change, with uh, ecological uh, uncertainty, uh, with the, the unforeseen that we are experiencing now? So what uh, possibly can it be of use in facing the situation that we are having in the world today? But we have a break of 15 minutes? Yes, if we come back at, uh, we'll have a little bit longer, 20 past. Great.
Ja, precis. Det är Ja, precis. Ja. Vi kan köra på kontakt. Man ser liksom bara namn. Ja, jag tror inte att jag tror att jag tror att jag tror att jag det är tur att det funkar för de flesta slöna för någon annars. Vad är det du, du har någon samordning som svar? Nej, jag kan nu lägga för att jag var i direkt till det. Okej. Okay. Så att det är nu är det bara, ja, <laughs> mitt namn står på. Ja, du, men du jobbar inte på scenen för det? Jag jobbar, ja. jag jobbar mycket med fristående. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, vad läser du på? Jag läser den här Sprite Edition Lectures Change, om det var om en ordning för Ja, men det är spännande. Ja, men det känns kul. Jag tycker att scenen verkar spännande i lag. Det känns kul att se lite mer. Börja bra, tycker jag. Ja, men det är
had some water now, so. <laughs> yes, I'll let you get on with it. Yeah, so I take off where I ended, and uh, I'll slowly move into the developments of what I think to be developments of this approach, this particular approach, in the times that we're living today. It would be appropriate to start here with encountering resistance, maybe not resistance of the powers that be, but encountering resistance in a process of maybe working with art. Um, here, for example, uh, people are making the sculpting their body with their eyes closed. Kind of, I think I notice um, the resistance, the, the difficulty of doing this, for example, the guy on the right hand side, that you're not in control in a basic sense, that you, you, you lack the possibility of controlling with your eyes how the sculpture is coming about. So it's something that you have to fight with, you have to sort of stand up against, to overcome. But if you're able to do that, also the, often the rewards of being in a position can also be um, uh, appropriate to the amount of pain or the resistance that you are overcoming. And here I go a bit into the work of uh, Gerd Bista, as we pronounce his name in Dutch, an educational philosopher, who talks about education as existing with the world. And he says the encounter with the world manifests itself in the experience of resistance. So the encounter of the world comes about through this experience of resistance. There's maybe some echoes here of John Dewey, who said that no pain, no gain, that it's through the resistance that you actually meet the world. And he said, says, if you are in this uh, encounter, there's basically three options. The first one is that you're pushing harder and harder, but then you're the danger of pushing too hard and destroying what we encounter, to destroy the world. For example, if you pay attention to this uh, flower, or this uh, part of the flower that went around, this dried, uh, maybe somewhere up there, uh, with the seed container, that if you do it too little, um, soft or too, if you're not delicate enough, you might destroy what you're accounting, that you, you push too hard. The very opposite would be so that you are so frustrated about encountering resistance that it leads you to withdraw, to just say it's too difficult. And then we disappear from the world, so this is what Vista calls self-destruction. And then the third option is staying away from the two extremes in the middle ground between world destruction and self-destruction. So you, you're not making yourself too small, you're not making yourself too big. You exist with the world, and this is where the dialogue can take place, he says. And this is always a bit of a fluid position, always a position of uncertainty, of being vulnerable, of opening up to the world. And I think, um, maybe thinking about what these uh, constraints or these limits, this resistance does, one way to think about it is that you can also think of that these limits are actually enabling. The frame is giving you possibilities that you might not have thought of before. It's an intriguing uh, quotation by Igor Stravinsky, the composer. He said, the more constraints one imposes, the more one frees oneself of the claims that shackle the spirit. So this is highly paradoxical. The more constraints, the more freedom, in a way. So that the freedom is exactly coming about by working with the constraints, working with the limitations, meeting the resistance. So what I, for example, do sometimes in art activities is that we go out and start painting when it is at dusk, when the sun is almost disappearing, you don't see it quite well now, but at this moment in time you hardly see the colors that you have on your palette. You can only see if the colors are a bit light or a bit darker. You have to work with that uncertainty, that, that new possibility. But at the moment, there can be a moment that you just let go, you say, well, I don't maybe end up making a very strange painting, but let's see what happens, just to feed your curiosity. And then you might make a painting that if you see it the next day, when it is in full daylight, it might look quite different than what you, what you had intended, but maybe this freedom suddenly gives you new possibilities that you can use in a new situation. And that brings me to the wicked problems. So one way of looking at the problems that we are facing in the world today is that they are basically wicked. Wicked means bad or nasty or un unsurmountable. But there's some quality of the problems that we find very, very hard to cope with. Um, maybe an immediate dramatic example is the forest fires that were here in Sweden this summer. Where do you start? 
first start might be to, to, to uh, put uh, water on it, to put uh, or some kind of foam to get rid of the fire. But is it taking it away? The fire might go on under the ground. But then, what is causing it? Is the drought coming by, coming about by climate change? It's most likely it is. But maybe also the uh, monoculture of the forest has something to do with that these fires are erupting. That is maybe some example of a wicked problem. That where do you start? Where where how do you fight this? You need to start with educating the new generations that they have another way of related to the forest. Um, but it's it's almost that if you want to put out the fire at one spot, it might ignite at another spot. It is sort of interlinked. And this brings me to um, this film that was uh, shown on Dutch uh, television um, uh, in December. Uh, it is an interview uh, portrait of uh, Paul Kingsnorst, who established the Dark Mountain Movement. And he talks about windmills and how he reflects on the impact that windmills have, which we all think is a very fitting solution for, for one way to tackle climate change. Let's see if it starts. I'll just tell what he's what, what he's uh, telling in this film is that this uh, wind, this windmill park uh, somewhere on a mountain in um, in Scotland is uh, that actually to uh, to make this that you need to bring in concrete, bring in steel, bring in plastic from all kinds of places, and that he points at the paradox that you have that uh, if you if we continue with the same kind of economy that we have today, that the amount of um, uh, windmills and solar cells that we need to uh, keep on continuing the economy that we have is indefinite always. That we it's, we're never will be able to build enough windmills and solar cells to feed the kind of economy that we have today. And then he reflects on what these windmills in itself do to the landscape, do to the bird life and so on. And it's, so it makes it very sad to sort of uh, that what we hope is a solution in itself is causing new problems. And, to me, it is a nice experience, uh, ex example of a wicked problem. And then maybe to define what a wicked problem is, it's like here I leave on Terry Irwin from Transition Design. He says it's a type of ill-defined, complex, systemic, and purportedly unsolvable problems. The problems are comprised of seemingly unrelated but yet interdependent elements, each of which manifests its problems in their own right at multiple levels of scale. The ability to solve wicked problems will call for new ways of thinking about design, our world, and the human presence in it. So, it's this idea that we have to think in a quite new way to deal with it, because they happen at different uh, uh, points and at multiple levels of scale. In a text by these uh, Finnish researchers called The Pedagogy of Interconnectedness for Encountering Climate Change as a Wicked Sustainability Problem, they argue that climate change is a wicked problem of our time. It's a phenomenon that is difficult to combat as prevailing ways of thinking and behaving. To combat wicked problems of sustainability, it is vital to be aware of their interconnectedness. New ways of thinking are needed as wicked problems can be solved with the same strategies of knowing that have resulted in these problems. This is reminiscent of this famous quote of Einstein, that we cannot solve problems with the same level of thinking that caused the problems in the first place. To deepen the understanding of different dimensions of climate change, transdisciplinary knowing is relevant. There is a need for complementary use of artistic, embodied, experiential, symbolic, spiritual, and relational learning, especially in the vital educational task of reconnecting learners to the earth. So, it's, I think it's um, telling that we have this whole list, it's a complementary use of artistic, embodied, experiential, symbolic, spiritual and relational learning as ways to fight something that in itself is a sort of interdisciplinary or a multidimensional phenomenon. So you cannot engage only one mode of thinking. You have to think in a rather diverse way. So not approach it with just one line of thought, one way of purposively engaging with the problem. Bateson, uh, I, I alluded to him before, 
he gave an example of such a situation uh, where you're facing maybe a wicked problem or what he would call a double bind. And he gave this sort of uh, example which in a way encapsulates it. And he says, imagine a Zen teacher, and he has a stick in his hand, and in front of him is sitting a Zen student, a student of the disciple, of, uh, getting acquainted with the, the Zen Buddhistic practices. And then he says to the student, if you say that I have a stick in my hands, I will hit you. If you say that I don't have a stick in my hand, I will hit you as well. Well, the student is a bit puzzled. And, um, the teacher says, and if you say nothing, I will also hit you. All the three options will cause him to be hit. So what is the student to be, uh, what is he to do? How can he deal with such an impossible situation? Any step that he takes will get him into trouble. And then Basin says, maybe the only thing, or the appropriate thing to do, is to grab the stick from the hands of the teacher, thereby denying the stalemate, the, the lockup that you find yourself in. And by grabbing the stick from the hand of the teacher, you make a jump. So you kind of deny the impossible situation that you find yourself in, and that locks you in a narrow uh, set of possibilities. And that's maybe one way to think about uh, wicked problems, or wicked problems like climate change or the ecological emergency, that we somehow need to make that jump. We need to grab the stick in a situation that seems to be impossible. Basically, it may mean that we enter in a position of what John Keats, the poet, called negative capability. And he defined it as when a man is capable of being of uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So this ability to stand out, to hold out, to be comfortable in a way with uncertainty, with doubts, without being irritated by it, is uh, what he would call a capability, uh, being capable to handle that situation. The artist and writer Rebecca Solnit wrote a book about a field guide to getting lost. And she said, to be lost is to be fully present. And to be fully present is to be capable of being in uncertainty and mystery. So again, being capable of being in uncertainty. And she says, the job of artists is to open doors and to invite in the unknown, the unfamiliar. To calculate on the unforeseen is perhaps exactly the paradoxical operation that life most requires of us. So rather than to run away from the unknown, from the unfamiliar, it is to invite it in, to open the door for it even calculate for it, to prepare yourself for it, to be ready for the things that are unforeseen and unpredictable. And this is the point she makes, one of the points, is that art is uh, maybe the way to go about this, that art can train you to be in this position of facing the unforeseen. Uh, this is um, maybe you know her face, Mary Oliver, she died a few days ago. She also talks about this being with this uh, uncertainty, hope this works. Something with the video that suddenly. Something... I don't know what it is, sorry, that, but she makes exactly the same point that, um, that there is quality of being able to accept uh, the mystery as it is, the things that you are uncertain about, and accepting that for some things there are no answers to be found. It's sort of in the more, much more poetic way that she says it. And um, yeah, this leads me to the final slide. It's in this uh, working with the eyes, uh, the pedagogy of the light in the eyes, I think there's something about it you might say, why is it that people uh, start to uh, brighten up? Why are they so present? Why do you have this idea that there are rays coming from their eyes? Maybe it can be that something of your eyes it gets a bit uh, more moisturous, that you, 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 you start to reflect the light because you, the, the cover of your eye becomes more fluid. And this also happens when we cry, of course. And I think it's maybe interesting to reflect on it, the close relationship between the bursts of laughter, of excitement, on the one hand, this tears is my brain, and the tears of sorrow and pain, that actually it are the same tears that are brought about. So the, in both cases, we are maybe a bit more present to the situation than we are in ordinary or more common circumstances. So that in the ability to deal with pain, uh, there's also this relation as dealing with passion, of being in a way more alive, more present to the world. 
And to me, it is this quality that we need, or that may be a good starting point if we are to find ways to, to uh, meet the big challenges of our time, that we allow ourselves to be in this presence, and thereby we are more ready to access or to engage with whatever comes our way. So this is my talk. And um, yeah, it's a pity that the videos didn't work, because they could tell it so much better, both Paul Kingsmans and uh, Mary Oliver, than my summary. Anyhow, it's also my way of improvising with the situation here that I have to deal with the limitations of technology in an evening like this. And I think the, the scene's almost going that direction. So, we have a bit of time. I wonder, especially if you're starting here in Simus, or you become new to Uppsala, what do you make of such a story? Or what response would it draw? Or maybe questions that you might have? Yeah, yeah I agree with you. Um, 